Good morning, everyone. Our lesson for today is about the elements of fiction. But before that, let us discuss or let us define what fiction is. Fiction is defined as any imaginative recreation of life in prose narrative form. Fiction writers aim at creating legitimate untruths since they seek to demonstrate meaningful insights into the human condition. So it means that a work of fiction is a or a work of fiction portrays the situations or the characters or let's say the dialogue in a way that it looks like authentic or truthful. Okay? So it means it's like a representation or recreation of what's happening in real life. Now, what are the different elements of fiction? First element of fiction is the narrator or the narrative voice, also known as the point of view. So it's from what perspective the story is being told. So narrative point of view is the perspective from which the events in the story are observed or recounted. To determine the point of view, we have to identify who is telling the story, that is, the viewer through the eyes or through whose eyes the reader see the action, also known as who is the narrator of the story. Okay? So what are the different types of narrative voice or point of view? Number one or letter A, we have the omniscient. A story told in the third person. The narrator's knowledge, control, and prerogatives are unlimited, allowing authorial subjectivity. So in this case, the narrator the, or the third person narrator knows everything, okay? Even the background of the, um, or of the characters of the major and the minor characters. He knows everything, okay? How about the limited omniscient? A story told in the third person in which the narrative voice is associated with a major or minor character who is not able to see or know all, may only be able to relate the thoughts of one, of one or some characters but not others, may not know what happened off stage or in the past so that's the difference between omniscient and limited omniscient the first one knows everything about all the characters even their past okay or their backstory but when we say limited omniscient it's limited to a specific major or a specific minor character and this limited omniscient narrator may only know some points or some information about the characters, okay? He doesn't have the knowledge about his about the character's uh, backstory and such, all right? Next, we have the first person. Usually, we can say that the story is being told in the first person point of view when we see the pronoun I, which is correct, right? It says there that the story is told from the first person I personal point of view, usually that of the main character. Okay, so it means, so in the first person, usually who's speaking is the main character. Okay, but there are different types of first person point of view so the first one is interior monologue it's the first person train of thought overheard by the reader it's not spoken out loud as is a monologue so this one the interior monologue is the way of expressing what the characters think or the voice inside his head the next type of first person point of view is the subjective narration it says here, first person, the narrator seems unreliable, tries to get readers to share his or her side or to assume values or views not usually presumed by the reader. 
So, what does it mean? This subjective narration, the reason why it's called subjective, is because the story is being told or recounted in the lens of one character. So, it means it's only limited to what the specific character or what the narrator feels, what the narrator thinks, or what the narrator, let's say, what the narrator knows. Okay? An example of this type of narration is the anti-hero characters. So, they are convincing the readers, okay? They are trying to convince the readers in the aim of justifying their actions. The second one is detached autobiography. So, it's first person. This case, it's a reliable narrator that guides the reader. The narrator is the main character often reflecting on a past self, sometimes an adult recounting an event from childhood. So, why is it reliable? Although it's still a first-person point of view, or it's still a type of first-person point of view. So, this detached autobiography says there, the character or the narrator is re reflecting on his past self. So, it means he's analyzing if what he did in the past is correct or if it's wrong. So, that's why it is reliable, okay? Or the narrator here is considered reliable. Another example of that, aside from an adult recounting an event from his childhood, it could also be the main character telling the readers about the hardships of his past life or of his previous life experiences, okay? So he's evaluating his decisions. Next is memoir or observer narration. First person, the narrator is an observer rather than the main participant. The narrator can be uh, the confidant or the eyewitness or chorus. They provide offstage or background information. So we are done with the first person. Now let's go to the last type of um, narrative voice. And this, that is the framed narrative. So, some narratives, particularly collections of narratives, involve a framed narrative that explains the genesis of and or gives a perspective on the main narrative or narratives that follow. So, there are stories that have a lot of embedded stories. And what explains the genesis or the overall uh, concept of the story is the framed narrative, also known as the frame story, or we may say it's the umbrella story, okay? For example, I know that most of us, we are familiar with the Arabian Nights, right? We are familiar with the Arabian Nights as the collection of different stories. But then again, What's the reason? What's the reason behind Sharazad telling new tale each night and finishing each story or each tale every morning? That is being explained in the frame story. Okay? Next, let's go to the to another um, element of fiction which is setting. So setting is not just about time and place. There are a lot of considerations for us to describe the setting comprehensively, okay? So when and where, these are, these are the questions that we have to consider and under what circumstances, what cultural content, if there's any, these are all the place, where and time, when and reason or reasons why the action or events occur. So, the first consideration in setting is our place. When we talk about place, this is the physical environment where the story takes place. 
But what makes the place alive? What makes it authentic in our imagination? Okay? That is or one special feature of place will allow us to reach that authenticity. And that is the local color. Okay? The use of regional details to add interest and sometimes meaning to the story. Use of local color may include a description of a specific locale, a manner of dress, customs, speech patterns, and slang expressions. So meaning, when we talk about local color, these are specific characteristics that distinguish a specific locale or a specific place from other places. Okay? These are the characteristics that show the differences in or the differences of the different countries. Okay? These are the local characters. For example, usually, um, you can really imagine if a short story is set in the Philippine setting because of the way the setting is described. For example, there is Bahay Kubo, um, there is a field, the common life of the Filipino people. And one concrete example that I can give to you is the story, We Filipinos Are Mild Drinkers. So, in that story, one element there is lambanog, which is familiar to all of us. And when we talk about lambanog, we know that this is a distinguishing feature or characteristic or element that can be found in the Philippines, okay? So, that is local color. Next. So, the next element is time. So, when we talk about time, time includes several dimensions, okay? What was going on at that time? What, um, what importance has the period or the time span of events with regard to the themes, motives, characterizations, atmosphere, and etc. So, when talking about uh, time as part of the setting, so we may cite the century, the decade, okay? We may also um, include the hours, the days, weeks, months, years, decades, in which the action takes place, okay? And the effects of the setting may include a particular atmosphere, insight to the characters or their motivations, and a key or connection to a reflection of other aspects of the story. Next, let us have plot and plot structure. We are familiar with plot, right? It's the series of events or actions in the story. Okay, so these are the guide questions. If we are to look for the plot, what happens in the story? What is the design or the structure or the timeline of the narrative? As I said earlier, the plot is the series of events or actions that occur in the story. And one element that pushes the plot forward is the conflict or the friction or battle. Okay, Conflict and fiction is the opposition of forces or characters. This friction usually fuels the action. So it fuels the rising action. Okay, and may incite later events. So, what are the different types of conflict? So, these types were already discussed by our previous teachers. We have the man versus man, the individual versus another individual, diba? Right? If you are, if you have a conflict with your friend, so that's man versus man. Why do I use um, our personal experience because we are the characters of our own life story. Okay, next, 
human versus nature. So it's individual versus the physical world. Human versus the society. The individual versus the civilization or order. And human versus herself or himself. He's battling against himself. So the individual versus the self. And another element is order. Narrative events may be related in different orders. So it's not or stories do not usually start with once upon a time and ended with they lived happily ever after. So as we become more creative, there are different orders that we use in narrating a story. Examples are chronological or linear, the natural order. We also have the in media res, wherein it means in the middle of things, we start at the middle, or begin in the present and return to the past. But our order is not limited to this or to these examples because we can be creative as much as we can. So, what are the different divisions of plot? So, this is very familiar to us. Exposition, rising action, then going to the climax, falling action, and then to the denoma or to the unnutting of events. Okay? So, in the exposition, we learn the different details about the characters and usually, the setting is being introduced on this part, okay? And then we have the rising action wherein the conflict starts to arise and then it will reach the climax or the highest intensity, okay? And then falling action and then the denoma for the solution. Next, another element of plot is flashback. A scene inserted into a film, novel, story, or play to show events that occurred at an earlier time. This technique is used to complement the events in the present of the story. It means it allows us to understand, let's say, why this character is acting this way or why the events happen this way. The flashback will help us or will yeah will help us to understand for example although it's done already i always watch his into her okay so where there is a an example of flashback there one example of flashback in his into her is when dave remembers what happened in his brother right and he also remembers their his past with Kim, why they broke up. So that's an example of flashback. Next is foreshadowing, a literary device in which the outcome of the struggle or conflict is anticipated or hinted at by such elements as speech, chess, or actions of characters or by symbols in the story okay so it's like the clue about the events that will happen in the latter part of the story so foreshadowing comes in different forms it may be in the form of dialogue for example in romeo and juliet okay romeo said that my life was better ended by their hate and blah 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 something like that so it's it's an anticipation or it's a foreshadowing of his fate wherein um he will die right because he will commit suicide another thing is it can come in the form of a title for example are you familiar with the author or the writer Edgar Allan Poe? So, he has this story entitled The Fall of the House of Asher. So, 
it's a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in their house and even in the entire family. And what happened in the house and in the family. So the physical house was distracted and then the entire family was demised. Okay? And another one. In our everyday life, foreshadowing also appears. Let's say the evening was very silent, it was very still, and then suddenly there was a cold breeze and then it became a windy night. So it gives us the clue that there will be a storm, right? It foreshadows a storm. So that is foreshadowing. Then another element of fiction is resolution. Okay, and or the ending part. And there are several types of ending. It can be a happy ending, just like in fairy tale. It can be a tragic or unhappy ending, just like in Romeo and Juliet. Okay, it says there, many events in life do not end pleasantly. So literary fiction that emulates life is more apt to have an unhappy conclusion forcing the reader to contemplate the complexities of life. And sometimes, these kinds of story helps us to reach catharsis, wherein there's a sense of cleansing, okay? And in our emotion, sometimes we cry, yeah. So there's a sense of cleansing in our emotion. And open-ended or lack of resolution, no definitive ending or resolution, of course, leaving the reader to ponder the issue raised by the story, also known as cliffhanger. Next, another thing is suspense. So, critical investigation will ask the more important questions why rather than what. Suspense is most often produced either by a mystery or by dilemma. Okay, so that's very uh, understandable already. Artistic unity is essential to have a good, effective, successful story. Nothing in the story is irrelevant, superfluous. That is, the story contains no detail or element that does not contribute to the meaning. So it means you do not just put or use a certain element for the purpose of just placing it in the story. There is a purpose why you used a mirror. There is a purpose why you let your character drink a certain liquor, let's say. Okay, So there should be unity. The elements in your story should be connected to one another and it should create meaning. And motifs, recurring or recurring structures, contrasts, or literary device that can help to develop and to inform the major themes of the story. These are the elements that recur. Okay? So our next element is character. So, character is the element, emotional, and social qualities to distinguish one entity from another. In short, our character or our characters are the ones who are taking or performing a specific role in our story. They can be people, animals, spirits, pieces of furniture, and other animated objects. And character development is the change that a character undergoes from the beginning of a story to the end. The importance of a character to the story determines how fully the character is developed. So, some characters are dynamic that they undergo character development. And characterization is the process by which fictional characters are presented or developed. So, in characterization, if we are to write a story, we have to think deeply of our characters. What are their characteristics? What are their attitudes? We also have to 
uh, to describe their physical features or even the way they dress. I remember when I was in college, when we were tasked to to create our character, so we underwent the process of characterization. So we listed uh, their different characteristics and we even draw the character himself. Okay? So... We have to identify, we have to develop, okay, our characters. We have to give them life. Yeah, that's the process of characterization. And there are different ways on how we present our characters, okay? So, there's a big difference between showing and telling. So, let us take a look at the given example or at the example of expository or direct presentation. It's more on telling, okay? So, occupied in observing Mr. Bingley's attention to her sister, Elizabeth was far from suspecting that she was herself becoming an object of some interest in the eyes of his friend. Mr. Darcy had at first scarcely allowed her to be pretty, he had looked at her without admiration at the ball, and when they next met, he looked at her only to criticize. But no sooner had he made it clear to himself and his friends that she had hardly a good feature in her face, that he began to find it was rendered uncommonly intelligent by the beautiful expression of her dark eyes. So, why is it an example of direct representation? When we talk about direct representation, uh, the narrator or let's say the author is describing or explaining the qualities of a certain character. Okay? So, the narrator is explaining the characteristics or the qualities of a certain character. In the given example, Austen, Jane Austen is the writer of that one, uses direct characterization in this passage to describe Elizabeth through the eyes of Mr. Darcy. So, Mr. Darcy uh, described her as someone who has a good feature in her face, right? She has... A beautiful expression in her dark eyes. Yeah. Next is dramatic or indirect representation. Unlike the first one, which is expository or direct presentation, in this one, we are more on the showing part. We do not directly say that this character is this or that. But we describe or we allow the readers to um, anticipate the characteristics or the qualities of a specific character on the way he speaks or even on the way he dresses or on the way he acts, okay? So, in the dramatic or indirect presentation, actions are being shown, okay? To present what kind of person the character is. So, let's have an example from the Grapes of Wrath. Joad took a quick drink from the flask. He dragged the last smoke from his reveling cigarette and then, with calloused thumb and forefinger, crashed out the glowing end. He rubbed the butt to a pulp and put it out the window, letting the breeze suck in. Suck it from his fingers okay so the grapes of wrath was written by john steinbeck so there a he describes the character's personality indirectly he didn't say that he's a blue collared worker right you can see there but because of the indirect characterization of using the props of a worker such as cigarette or the callous thumb or callous hands, right? And even the whiskey, then we get to understand 
that he is a worker, that he is a blue collar worker. Okay, so that is indirect presentation. Now let's go to the different types of character. So we have static, dynamic, and stereotype. I just chose these three, although we have a lot of types of character. So the static character, these can be either round or flat characters, but they do not change during the story. Okay, so keep in mind that when we talk about static character, this is the character that does not change. Okay, but when we talk about it, because it says here, these can be either a round or flat character. When talking about flat character, this character is a one-dimensional character. Typically, he's not the center of the story. However, when we talk about round character, this character is complex, fully developed character. Okay? So, that is static. A character that does not change. However, when we talk about dynamic character, a developing character, usually at the center of the action, who changes or grows to a new awareness of life. Okay, so this is the kind of character that changes or develops. Sometimes at the beginning of the story, he is bad. And then as he understands the world or the life, as he grows, he becomes good. And when we talk about stereotype, a character so little individualized, as to show only qualities of an occupation or national, ethnic, or another group which he or she belongs, okay? So these are familiar characters identified by um, oversimplified pattern or behavior. For example, let me show you these pictures. When we talk about cheerleader, this is the feature or... This is the outfit or the physical quality that usually comes into our mind. When we talk about cowboy, so that's the get up, right? And when we talk about wicked stepmother, it's a stereotype made popular in many fairy tales. So that's the usual aura that comes into our mind. They are, pa or this kind of wicked stepmother, is popularized in, let's say, the S Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and in Cinderella. Okay, so that is stereotype. And we also have anthropomorphic characterization. It is the characterization of animals or inanimate objects or natural phenomena. As people, they, it usually appears in Aesop's fable, wherein animals are given um, human characteristics. Now, let's go to tone and mood. So, what are tone and mood? Mood, also known as atmosphere, is the dominant emotion feeling that pervades a story. It is less physical and more symbolic, associative and suggestive than setting, but often akin to the setting. So how does setting and mood relate to one another or to each other rather? Okay, so sometimes if the story is set in a sunny day, of course the mood is usually carefree or happy. And if the story is set in a haunted house, then it gives us a sense of tension or fear. That's why these two elements, mood or atmosphere and setting, are really related to each other. Okay? So basically, mood is what the reader feels in the story. Every story has some kind of atmosphere, but in some, it may be the most important feature or at least a key to the main points of the story. Atmosphere is created by descriptive skills, dialogue, narrative, language, and such. So, the mood or the atmosphere is built by the dialogue and by the other details of the story. Okay, for example, 
if you read Edgar Allan Poe's The Cask of Amontillado, it contains narrative description of entombment. So you will really feel um, the sense of morbidity and horror when you read the story The Cask of Amontillado. Next is tone. So what's the difference between mood and tone? The tone is the narrator's attitude toward his subject and audience. Narrator's tone may show, for example, admiration for the subject or a character, or the narrative tone can suggest pity or hostility. On, uh, on the other hand, the narrator may be um, condescending or false cue with the audience. Sometimes the narrative tone is ironic. The narrative tone may be demonstrated by direct comment, by characterization, or by choice of words, symbols, and other literary terms. So just like mood, the different elements of the story also build the tone. So basically, tone is an author's attitude toward the subject matter. The author's tone in a literary work can reflect their personal opinion or the tone can channel the feelings of a particular character. Okay, so the tone is what the author feels. Just keep that in mind, okay? Now, let's go to symbols. So, symbols are, connect, are concrete objects or images that stand for abstract subjects. So, these symbols or these concrete objects, their meaning is not literal, all right? Because we associate them or they stand for abstract subjects. When we talk about concrete objects, these are the objects that we can touch, we can see, we can feel. And abstract is, yeah, it's more of feelings, okay? So the objects and images have meanings of their own but may be ascribed subjective connotations such as heart is usually associated to love, skull or crossbones to poison, color green to envy, light bulb to idea, seasons to times in a lifespan. So, although they have their own literal meaning, but they can stand for abstract subjects, okay? So, there are two types of symbols. It can be established or general, or private or personal. So the meaning of an established symbol is derived from is derived from outside the context of the story, from received association. Symbolism is agreed upon universally by culture, religion, tribe, kinship. Meaning these are the symbolisms that we already know universally, usually. Okay? For example, uh, we use journey to represent life. We use water to represent rebirth or new beginning. And we use lion to represent courage. So wherever you go, this is universally known. Okay, that's why is it's established or general. However, when we talk about private or personal, defined only within the context of of the story in which it appears, meaning it's only true in that story, okay? For example, in Eliot's poem, um, The Red Rock, okay, in his poem, The Wasteland, the red rock is a symbolic of the spiritual shelter, shelter of the Anglican Church, although this is not a received symbol traditional to any particular culture. It means that the symbolism of red rock as a spiritual shelter is only true to the poem composed or written by T.S. Eliot, The Waste Land. Okay, so that's the difference between established and private. Now, let's go to theme. So, theme is another important element in a story or in fiction so these are the guide questions why did this writer bring these characters to this place at this time 
what is the point? What do readers know or understand? So the theme can be a revelation of human character, may be stated briefly or at great length, but it's not the moral of the story. Keep in mind that the theme, okay, is a statement about human condition. For example, mankind exists in an indifferent world or man's self-importance is ridiculous in the comparison with the immensity of the universe. So, these are views about life and these are not morals or lessons from the story. Okay? So, that's... Uh, that's the difference between um, theme and moral. Theme is the central or dominating idea in the literary work. Okay? Next, let's go to irony. We always hear the word iron irony. Life is so ironic. So what does it mean? The irony is a term with a range of meanings, all of them involving some sort of discrepancy or incongruity. It should not be confused with sarcasm, which is simply language designed to insult or to cause emotional pain. So, sarcasm is different from irony because sarcasm is just for the purpose of insulting. The irony is used to suggest the difference between appearance and reality. What is supposed to happen? And what really happened, okay? Between expectation and fulfillment. The complexity of experience to furnish indirectly an evaluation of the author's material and at the same time to achieve compression. Okay, so there are three types of irony. We have verbal, dramatic, and situational irony. So, what's the difference? Verbal irony, what is said? is actually the opposite of what is meant or intended. So, verbal irony occurs when a narrator or character says one thing, but he means something else. For example, you're, you went to your friend's house or to his room, and it's so messy. You will say, Wow, you could win an award for cleanliness. So it's verbal irony because you are saying that he can win an award for cleanliness where in fact, that's not really what you mean, right? Okay, because his room is very messy. Next is dramatic irony. This one, it occurs when the reader perceives something. The character or narrator in a work of literature does not know. We can easily observe this. Not just by reading, but by watching. We can observe this in the different teleseries. We know that a character will be shot, but he doesn't know, right? That's dramatic irony. We know that something bad will happen. We know that the character will be surprised by his boyfriend. But this character who will be surprised doesn't know that that's going to occur. So that's dramatic irony. And situational irony is the discrepancy between appearance and reality or between expectation and fulfillment or between what is and what would seem appropriate. For example, a fire station burns down. So it doesn't serve its purpose. Not really, it doesn't serve its purpose. It's just that it's so ironic because um, the office, right, that is concerned in killing the fire experiences it, okay? And an FB post complaining about how useless FB is. So, why is it ironic? You are complaining, but you are still using. Or let's say, someone who bought a gun in order to protect himself, but then again, what happened is, he was killed using the gun that he bought for him. So, that is 
situational irony. Okay? So, and our next element is dialogue. So, dialogue is very important. It really pushes the story forward. Okay? So, dialogue is the direct, quoted, verbal exchanges between characters. It can be used to break break up the narrative. So, the writer can use the dialogue to balance the other elements of fiction such as the description. So, sometimes um, it's boring if we will only read purely description. It's also better if there is dialogue that can break the series of narrative. Okay? It can also be used to advance the plot. What characters discuss can ultimately change the course of the story. It can also develop the conflict. So, when the characters are arguing, bite builds tension. We can feel it. Instead of just saying that they are fighting, that, the, that there is a conflict between the two characters, it would be authentic on our part if we will read their verbal exchanges. Right? And it, pres it can be used to present information. Dialogue can be used as an alternative to exposition. Instead of being fed dry facts, the reader will enjoy learning the background of the story. So sometimes, uh, we can use dialogue instead of narrative. Let's say a character telling what happened in his life, okay, at the beginning of the story so that will catch our interest that is known as hook okay and to develop character so we learn about the character and his qualities and his characteristics not just by his physical features not just by by his clothes we learn about the character based on his personality based on his intelligence and based on his age. And where can we see um, their personality? Where can we see or where can we anticipate how intelligent the character is? And where can we um, like think of the age of the character? That's based on the words that the character is using. So basically, based on his dialogue. Based on... Um, the way he expresses himself, we can really see if this character is a kid or uh, this character is a grown adult. Based on he, how he makes reasoning or based on how he reasons out, then we can determine if this character is intelligent or not or if he has a good personality or not. So... That's how important dialogue is, right? So, that's it. I think um, I already I was able to discuss the important elements of fiction. So, I discussed these elements so that we can easily analyze the stories that we are to tackle in our future, uh, in our future classes, okay? So, I hope that you learned something from our discussion thing or from the lecture rather thank you for listening see you in our synchronous class and next meeting we will discuss the different literary approaches for us to be able to easily interpret the different literary pieces in our course okay i hope that you took down notes because i will also um, have a short recap in our synchronous class okay so that's it thank you so much and have a nice day everyone